When I first started a vegetable garden here in Ireland years ago, one of the crops that I was most excited about being able to grow was squash and pumpkins, as I really like them as a plant and a crop and also as a food. Unfortunately, Ireland does not have a great climate for growing these heat-loving plants, but I keep trying. Where I grew up in Canada, it's easy to grow squash and pumpkins in the hot summers. But with the cooler summers of this maritime climate of Ireland, squash takes a lot longer to fruit and to mature. Unfortunately, we often get late frosts in the spring and early frosts in the autumn, which can really constrain the length of the season for these tender plants. And then there's the wind, which can cause a lot of damage to the big leaves. It is possible to get a decent crop with the right varieties, a reasonably sheltered garden, some skill as a grower, and luck with the weather. And with the extended warm weather that we had this past summer, I was really hoping for an excellent harvest, but I was a bit disappointed. I used to grow a couple of different varieties of squash and pumpkins, but for the last few years, I've only grown one variety in the family scale gardens that I manage, mainly to make it easier to compare the results between the gardens and between each season. I've stuck with one hybrid variety of squash called Crown Prince, which seems to do well here, and the uniformity of the F1 hybrid variety also helps with this comparison. I planted a total of 29 plants across the six gardens, using the same seed sown on the same date, transplanted within a few days of each other, and harvested all at the same time. There are of course differences in the six gardens, with different soil treatments, amounts of compost infertility, the density of plants, what other crops are growing nearby, and no doubt also differences in watering, weeding, and care. But the density of plants, or how much space each plant has to grow in, is perhaps the trickiest to adequately measure, as the squash plants are aggressive vining plants that take up a lot of space. So while comparing the yields of each garden on a kilogram per square meter basis is interesting, it's far from precise. For example, the vines and roots of the three squash plants that I planted in the four square meter bed of the intensive garden did not respect the boundary of the bed that I double dug for them. But I can evaluate how well each crop did by comparing the average yield per plant or the average weight of each of the squash that was produced, which helps to give a better picture. Looking at the three different measurements, it seems that the polytunnel garden did the best, but that's to be expected in the warmth of the protected microclimate. The extensive, intensive, and no-dig gardens were broadly comparable, I think, even though they diverged quite a bit in terms of the average weight of the squash that was produced versus the kilograms per square meter. And I think this is largely due to the differences in the density or space between the plants. The polyculture garden was perhaps least successful, and I think the yield really suffered mainly because I planted too many plants in the space, and there was additional competition from the intercropping of runner beans. The simple garden had the largest area for growing squash in and also did quite well in all the factors that I measured. What I find more interesting though is when I compare the results from this year to what I was able to harvest last year when I grew the same variety of squash in the five outside gardens. Unfortunately, the crop in the extensive garden didn't produce any mature squash last year due to a failed experiment that I tried with direct sowing and the growing season not being long enough. This leaves four gardens to compare between the two seasons, and interestingly, three of them produced a better crop last year, as measured in total yield of kilograms per square meter, as well as the yield per plant and the average size of each of the squash that was harvested. This is a bit disappointing and unexpected given that there was so much more warmth this past summer, but perhaps the cooler weather in September and October may have offset this. We did have a lot less rainfall this year, for most of the time that the squash were growing, and although I watered the gardens a fair amount, in hindsight I probably didn't water enough. Another issue with this season is that we had very strong winds in the middle of September, which caused a fair amount of damage to the leaves of the squash plants. And then we had an early frost on the 28th of September, which put an early end to the growing season for this tender crop. Last year we didn't get a strong frost until well into November, which gave more time for the squash to mature. So, this season we had a warmer but shorter and drier growing season, and last year the season was longer, cooler, with more consistent levels of soil moisture, and unexpectedly that seems to have made quite a difference and produced a better squash crop in these three gardens. All of this makes sense, apart from the fact that the squash patch in the simple garden definitely went against this trend. Looking at the yield per square meter, the crop this year did slightly better than it did last year, and it's pretty much the same thing when measuring the yield per plant. Even the average size of the squash that was harvested was remarkably consistent, and from this garden alone it would be hard to determine any significant differences in the growing seasons.
I find this kind of anomaly quite interesting as it prevents me from fixing on a particular reason or narrative too easily. I can't really assume that it was just the weather and there wasn't anything I could do about it. I suspect the combination of the ground cover fabric under the squash in the simple garden and the sheet composting underneath that probably helped to reduce evaporation from the soils and made a lot of difference. But I would have expected the substantial mulch of grass clippings in the no-dig garden to have had a very similar effect, but it didn't seem to have the same impact, so I guess that's not the whole story. Another possible difference is that I covered the plants in the simple garden with a crop cover for the first few weeks after transplanting, which I didn't get around to doing in the other gardens. This possibly gave the plants a better head start, but because the weather was so good at the time, I wouldn't have thought that this would make so much of a difference. Another possible benefit is the fact that the squash patch in the simple garden covered a much larger area and there was more room for each plant to grow in, which meant that there was less competition, especially from other crops. I imagine it was a combination of all these factors that helped to boost the yield in this garden in what ended up being a tough season for the other gardens. Another interesting thing that I noticed is that the plants in all of the gardens seem to stop setting fruit quite early in the season this year. Whereas last year, most of the plants seemed to try to produce additional squash right through until the end of the summer. While these later squash wouldn't have had time to mature, I harvested them as delicious, immature summer squash, a crop that I really missed this year. When I add this extra crop to the yield of mature squash, the differences between the seasons is even greater, except for in the simple garden where the data is almost the exact same for both years. I'm not sure what happened this year. It could have been a pollination issue or the plants not sending out as many flowers due to the stress of the drought. But this is definitely something that I'm going to watch in the coming seasons. But the squash that I did harvest this year seemed more mature than the crop I got last season, and with a better flavour, though it is hard to tell for certain as it is not something I can really measure or adequately compare with 12 months between the crops. It seems that the extra heat this year allowed the plants to grow quickly and for the squash to mature before the early frost. I wonder how much better the season and yield would have been if I had been able to supply as much water as these plants needed, or how bad the yields would have been if I hadn't watered at all. From this small sample, it seems that the methods that I used in the simple garden may be a more resilient way of growing squash and pumpkins here in Ireland. No doubt other varieties will do better in this variable climate, and I hope to do a trial of other varieties in a larger section of the black plot next year. But I'll stick with the same variety again for these gardens next year to have more seasons to compare. There are also a lot of other ways to improve this crop, including providing more space for each plant, creating better microclimate or protection in the spring, and protecting from early frost in the autumn, and of course providing better fertility and watering. But all of this is extra effort, and I have to keep in mind that achieving the highest yields or the best quality isn't necessarily the point. The point is growing good food to eat. This season I was able to harvest 65 squash weighing a total of 256 kilograms or 560 pounds and that will be feeding a lot of people throughout the winter and hopefully well into the spring if they store well. And that is the main point of growing them. And I got at least 20 kilograms of decent quality squash out of each of these gardens, even the ones with the smallest patch, which are results most growers in this climate would be quite happy with. But I know that this crop could be better, and I'm really interested in pushing the yield, quality, and resilience of this high-value crop. And I already have plans for how I'm hoping to improve things in each of the gardens next year. While I'd love to live in a climate where squash and pumpkins grow really easily, I'm beginning to realize that if you want to understand what the needs of a plant really are, grow it in marginal conditions or climate, as I think that's where the real learning seems to be. This YouTube channel is all about sharing what I learn and explore in this Red Gardens project. And if you haven't come across my channel before and like what you see, you may be interested in some of the other videos I've made in the past. And be sure to subscribe so that you can be updated when I release new videos in the future. And if you'd like to really support the project and make sure that I can continue to do this exploration and work in the gardens and to produce more videos in the future, please check out my Patreon page linked here or in the description below. But most importantly, thank you for watching.